I'm delighted to be joined now by Peggy Johnson. Um, Peggy has been CEO of Magic Leap since August, having previously served at Microsoft as EVP of Business Development and at Qualcomm as EVP of Global Market Development. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you for joining us. And thanks for your Thank wonderful, you. su wonderful support of your Irish roots throughout your career, including most recently as Microsoft's corporate sponsor for Ireland. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Leo. I'm uh, thrilled to be here, even t virtually. <laughs> uh, we have to make this uh, virtual stuff work for a little while longer, it sounds like. <laughs> It, it is a real shame we can't do this in person, but Peggy, yeah. what an exciting new role. I, I tried to summarize the company's mission as Magic Leap is a spatial computing company that's changing how people interact with the digital world through its aug advanced augmented reality platform. How did I do and what would you like to add to that? <laughs> that's pretty good, actually. Okay. Um, I think, you know, very simply, you can think of us as uh, you know, a headset that you wear and you still see your physical world and then we augment it with digital content. And that content can be video or text or even another person live uh, being streamed in uh, that appears as in your, you know, your den or your living room. <laughs> so it's, um, you, you, were, you were very close to the description and what you said. Excellent. So how has the transition to your new role gone for you personally? And what's your current priority set as CEO of Magic Leap? Well, I, in all honesty, it was a bit strange to join the company uh, during a pandemic. I interviewed with the board completely virtually. I had never met anybody at the company before I uh, started, with the exception of Roni, who had, was the previous CEO. So my entire management team, I, I had only met virtually. So it was a bit strange uh, to come on board and to say goodbye to Mac Microsoft as well uh, at the same time, all virtually. But really when I came um, into the company, it, it had experienced some challenges in you know, the year previous, but I have to say, I didn't find anything broken. There, there did needed to be some focus and the company had already pivoted to enterprise use cases. And I further narrowed that to just a few segments in the enterprise space, namely healthcare, telco, public sector, things along those lines. And we also limited the use cases to really what was something that kind of ex was accelerated during the pandemic where people had the need to continue to work and in the areas of training, for instance, uh, remote assistance, that sort of thing, and even 3D visualization. So design teams who couldn't physically be co-located because of the pandemic had a real need to come together virtually. So those are the areas of focus that I, I brought into the company. Great. I love the Magic Leap tagline that reality is just beginning. It's, it's a bit scary because I'm someone who feels at my stage of life, I'm just getting to grips with the current reality. Uh, but to borrow a term from the early days of 3G, what do you believe will be the killer apps for widespread AR and VR adoption? You know, I think one thing that has become very apparent is uh, we probably are not going to go back to the way we used to work before the pandemic. I, for instance, I don't think I'll be getting on the planes uh, for, for a two-hour meeting across the country anymore. <laughs> That's, uh, those are sort of things of the past. So that means we'll be relying more and more on video experiences. And I think that experience itself can certainly be further enhanced with AR and VR. And so for instance, we're working on an internal app right now that we, um, we call C3 for communications, collaboration, and co-presence. And those are the things that you know, we, we need to improve a bit more if we are to continue working in, in this virtual way. And so we are focused on uh, sort of bringing to life meetings. Think of uh, this that we're doing now as sort of a 2D meeting. We want to develop 3D meetings where people will actually uh, be sitting in the same room as you, but virtually. And I think that can take the place of quite a bit of travel. Certainly those first uh, times you meet somebody, it's nice to be one-on-one uh, -on -one and present. But after that, I think there'll be more and more technologies and, and applications in the AR space that can really help us uh, as we move to a less traveled time uh, in industry. 
Uh, that, that's really exciting, and and I think we'll all appreciate that because we're missing that human contact over the last nine months. So it's great to hear that there there's more present solutions on the way. In terms of the leadership leadership of companies coping with COVID nineteen, what do you think is is the most fundamental challenge that COVID nineteen has presented to leaders in terms of flexing their approach? Well, I think you you've said it in in that human element and. It's hard because we all had to very quickly overnight figure out how to work from home and to do so, keeping our corporate data secure and safe and to continue with business. And that was challenging for all of us, for every leader in the space um, as COVID began and has has continued. And that's why I think this idea of enhancing sort of the human element of meetings is so important. For instance, I hold my board meetings now inside of the uh, C3 application. It's internal right now, but um, you know, my board members are uh, calling in from all over the world and they actually come alive here in my den <laughs> behind wow. me. And uh, it's amazing. It's There's something about um, having them feel like they're physically in front of you that makes it feel like a meeting again. So if they walk behind me in virtual space, I hear the, the spatial audio fall, track the person. Uh, we can put up an infinite number of screens and look at a variety of uh, different uh, parts of the business. We can um, you know, turn to each other and you can see uh, expressions and some of the things that, that we're missing in a, in a sort of this 2D communications that we're all in right now. So I think AR can actually help during the recovery period and then post pandemic, because I think we can just make that experience more human, come, become more alive than, uh, than what we're all experiencing right now. That's amazing. And and it has been a leadership challenge for all of us over the last nine months. But Peggy, I wanted to stick with leadership for a second, but change tack a little bit. You've been an incredible role model for women in engineering and for women leading in the tech industry. And I've heard you speak many times about your deep commitment to furthering this agenda. And I know how generous you are in paying forward the personal success you've had. What for you are the most important traits of a leader in technology in general? And is there anything that women, um, uh, that it's, that's increasingly important for women to do in terms of asserting their leadership within technology? You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm asked that often about the, the qualities of leadership or the traits. And I think, you know, historically in the tech industry, leadership traits that um, revolved around assertiveness, confidence, uh, network building, those were ones that were celebrated. Uh, but there were other leadership traits equally valuable that frankly at times were a bit ignored by the tech industry, things like team building, empathy, um, communications and collaboration. And I think you know, not certainly there's no no hard line between uh, men and women in those traits, but I would say the first set of traits uh, may have aligned more with our male counterparts and the second set more with our female counterparts. And obviously a lot of crossover between the two. But I think the point is we need both of them to be a successful company. You really need all of those traits. And that is the type of leadership that I look uh, for when I'm when I'm adding to my own leadership team. So not everybody has all of those traits, but you certainly want all of those traits on a leadership team. And when you when you seek those traits out, your leadership team tends to end up being very diverse uh, because people, you know, maybe one or the or another of those traits, they happen to be um, you know, have high uh, specialization in. And so that is what for me is so important is building a, a diverse team with a diverse set of those traits. Cause you really can't get by in today's world with just one or two of those. You really need all of them. They're needed at different times in negotiations, in dealing with um, employee issues and dealing with external issues. Uh, so it's a bit of everything that you wanna have on a leadership team. 
That's great. Um, thank you. And, and I know you, you, you've got this incredible balance of warmth and gravitas that I really enjoy whenever I meet you. And you were one of the first meetings I had. So I've appreciated that about you for a long time. So I think it's a balance that's hard to get right, but you certainly exemplify it. You're, Thank you. Peggy, to change tie again a little bit, your, your LinkedIn profile mentions that you are forever grateful to the two women who inspired you to pursue engineering, which has in turn made you passionate about encouraging young women to pursue STEM careers. Can you tell us about those women as far as you're comfortable to? And then also, what advice do you have for young women taking up engineering as a career choice? Sure. Well, I was a business major in college to start with, and I had a job and I had was delivering mail uh, into the engineering department. And the two administrative assistants thought I was uh, there to um, to ask about engineering. And I said, no, I don't really even know much about engineering because no one had ever presented it to me as an option, frankly. Uh, and I loved math and science and people said, go into business. So it was an interesting conversation that um, pursued, that the ladies pursued with me because they, they essentially uh, brought up the whole idea of me becoming an engineer, which again was the furthest thing from my mind. And they talked about the problems that you can solve if, if you pursued a degree in engineering. And, and one of them said, the world will be your oyster if you do this, which I think is a line from Shakespeare. <laughs> but it, it was true. My, my world, I had, I had never seen myself in an engineering world. And they proved to me that there was so much more to it than whatever my stereotypical view of an engineer was. And frankly, I didn't know any female engineers. My dad had friends who were engineers, but I, I couldn't think of a single one. And so they really changed the course of my entire career by talking me into uh, changing my degree, which I did the very next day. And uh, I've, I've forever been thankful to those ladies. And it's, it's been the core of everything I've done since then. Even though I've moved to the business side, I still use all my engineering problem solving skills every day. So it was serendipity to a large extent that got you there. What, what do you think is changing for young women in terms of engineering as a choice? And what do you think is not changing enough yet in terms of young women choosing to do engineering? Yeah, you know, I think what's changing is the whole environment for women and, and frankly, diverse candidates to join uh, in the engineering or tech companies. I have to say, uh, early in my career, it can be a bit of a harsh environment. I'm somewhat introverted, shy, and I had joined, uh, you know, company that was uh, nearly all male, and I was the only female engineer for miles, really. And I didn't always feel comfortable in that environment uh, because, again, I think many of the traits that they celebrated, I didn't have. I wasn't super assertive, for instance. But I think what's changing is the idea that um, if we, as leaders, build inclusive environments for our employees, they'll do their best work. And luckily I had a manager who recognized in me that I communicated differently, that I had something to offer, but the environment wasn't super conducive to me doing my best work. And he helped change that environment for me. And I think that is what has changed the most since I joined uh, my first engineering company, geez, over 35 years ago now, that companies recognize having an inclusive environment will allow people to perform at their highest level for the company. And then I think what hasn't changed probably is the velocity of promotions of both females and I would say diverse uh, employees. We need to do more there. Largely companies are, are actually hiring at about the rate of percentage of, for instance, females who are graduating with engineering degrees. Companies are hiring at about that rate but it's, they're not doing a great job of keeping them and retaining them. And again, I think I could have perhaps washed out earlier in my career if not for the few managers who really understood me and helped me continue uh, with my career ambitions. 
And that is an area that we need to work a bit harder on in the tech industry is that velocity, that upward promotion of women. Um, Cause too often that model, you know, it starts out wide, but then it, it tends to narrow as women go up the chain and that's where work still needs to be done. I think I think that's that's right, and and it's a huge gap in the tech industry that we don't have more women, both joining and, as you say, continuing with their careers. So to, to change tech a little bit, and um, Peggy, and maybe moving towards the end of the interview, um, we we have been very fortunate to meet you in Ireland many times. Your warmth towards the country, following from Irish roots, has always been apparent. I, I couldn't really finish without asking you to talk a little bit about Ireland, what it means to you both personally and as a place to do business. Absolutely. So as you said, I have um, Irish roots. My grandparents were uh, born in, in Ireland and I carry dual citizenship, which I'm super proud of. Um, but, you know, it's I've always had an affinity for the country and the people and just the grit that Irish people have showed for, you know, centuries, to tell you the truth. It's been amazing to read Irish history. Uh, I took courses in college on Irish history. I've been fascinated about the journey of the Irish people. And it, it, when our daughter was looking to choose a university, uh, she ended up choosing Trinity College Dublin. And I was thrilled because uh, for four years I got to visit her there. I always made excuses to drop by Ireland. But it's really, um, it, it was an amazing time to tell you the truth. She joined at the start of the financial crisis. And you remember that was a tough time for Ireland, 2007, 2008, she started. And, and just watching how Ireland picked themselves up and uh, pushed forward and to where they're at today is just an unbelievable story of, I think, great success. And she uh, continues to this day to uh, be very close to her friends and, and um, acquaintances in, in Ireland. And now our youngest, actually, he's in his last year of engineering here in the States, and he's seeking an, uh, a summer internship in Ireland this summer. So if you, if you happen to know anything open, let me know. <laughs> but it, so we've just have this affinity that just remains and goes on. And I can't wait to be back in Ireland in person, not virtually, but actually there in person. And hopefully uh, very soon with the vaccines on their way, we'll be able to see each other again in person. Well, we can't wait to see you here either. Can I ask one follow-on question? I, uh, I read, sure. Reading a little bit over the weekend, I know you're a keen marathon runner. Did I pick it up right that the Dublin Marathon was your first marathon? <laughs> It was. And um, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done on that day. <laughs> I've done a few <laughs> since then, but it was so hard. But I remember the uh, the marathon organizers, everyone was so great. And I remember when I crossed the finish line, they gave me a Cadbury chocolate bar and a glass of Guinness. It was like, it was the best. <laughs> Yeah, no more needs to be said, really. That's the staple right. diet here in Ireland, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, I think I think that's how we've seen COVID-19 as well. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And, mm. uh, you know, it's been a really long year. I think it's with the faith of those people who know Ireland well that we've continued to persevere. And we really appreciate the partnership we have from everyone. Um, Peggy, thank you so much for your time today. It was super important to us. And we really appreciate you being here with us, albeit virtually. I wish you every success in your mission at Magic Leap, and I hope we'll see you back here in Ireland as soon as circumstances allow. Thank you, Leah. Looking forward to that. Have Thank a great day. Thank you, Peggy.